Today, we unpack the general election results from Thursday evening, Friday morning, focusing on the smaller parties. That's, uh, the Reform Party, the Greens, the Independents and the Liberal Democrats. We'll also be reflecting on the first 72 hours of the Labour government and we'll be taking a look at what's been happening across the channel with the French elections. Welcome to the Downtown Den Politics Podcast. Uh, my friends sort of used to run through the fields of wheat. Uh, you turn if you want to. The ladies not for turning. Uh, they will, it will cost. Um, I know words, I have the best words, but there's no better word than stupid. OK, so on Saturday, we got together to talk about the general election results and we looked what was likely to be Labour's new cabinet and the first sort of things that were going to be happening with Keir Starmer and his colleagues. And today I want to just unpack the election results as we said we would to focus on the smaller parties. We did talk about the Liberal Democrats on Saturday, Joe, but I think... We spoke mostly about the fact that they got this fantastic result, over 70 seats, the best ever performance for generations. But what we didn't really dig into was the strategy behind the strategy, if you like. So they targeted their resources mostly on blue wall seats. But there was this sort of unwritten pact, wasn't there, with the Labour Party, where I don't know whether people had spoken to each other they must have done because where the liberal democrats were the main contender in constituencies to beat the tories labor stayed away and vice versa i don't think enough has been made of that yet no i used to spend my life when i worked for paddy ashdown denying there were any pacts um with either party even though when i arrived in the office in 1992 there was a typewritten sheet between him Paddy and Neil Kinnock as to where the joint press conferences would take place in the result of a, you know, close Labour victory. Um, and as you know, then there was the later the Joe group named after me, which was a much more sort of it was secret, but it was a much more tacit um, relationship in terms of how we would work together because Tony Blair at that stage didn't expect a landslide. Um, so I think this one has been much more um casual if you like and i think it plays into what we've talked about before and particularly on saturday the idea that the public the voting electorate are much more canny about using their votes um and if you take away the tribal pressure on somebody to say well you've always been labor you've got to vote labor or live dem or conservative or, or whatever it is you actually end up with the result we've got um which is not perfect by a long chalk, but I don't think the Liberal Democrats would have done so well had there not been that sort of, you know, quiet withdrawal, standing aside, um, and as they did to, to Labour in other seats. Um, I mean, I think, you know, 71, 72 uh, MPs is quite astonishing, the highest number since 1923. And it will make a difference because, as I said before, they'll be on select committees, they'll have a much more visible um, uh, profile. Um, and Ed Davey, I think, has been... I think he's been quite interesting in, in how he's responded to the election result. And of course, he's absolutely delighted and rightfully so. But he said, you know, not only will the Liberal Democrats hold the government to account, they'd be very happy for the government to steal Lib Dem policies. And I think that is, you know, I think it tells you something about the sort of man he is and probably the sort of relationship that he's got with Keir Starmer, um, that they're not dissimilar. Uh, in many ways, although I can't see Keir Starmer doing bungee jumping anytime soon. <laughs> I wouldn't have thought so. Uh, I don't think his security people have let him, actually. But uh, the other thing, Kevin, it's wound me up a bit over the weekend because you've had these very sniffy right-wing commentators who are just listening to uh, the Spectator podcast earlier on this morning. So, oh, well, it's not really a landslide. Labour have only won 34% of the votes. You know, Starmer has been held by Farage. But actually, if you look at this in context, 
then, as I say, Labour stood back in many seats where they could have built votes up and vote share up. In a lot of the cities where Corbyn, as I say, built up these mountain type majorities, Labour didn't really put resource in, and an awful lot of people will have said, we know Labour are going to win here and they've stayed at home. And then I reminded myself that in 2019, didn't Boris Johnson have the help and assistance of Nigel Farage basically mm. standing down, <clears throat> lending them all these reform votes? And I'm sat there scratching my head thinking, this marvellous, this, you know, so from the Mail to the Spectator to the Express, all of a sudden, winning 410 seats doesn't really give you a majority. Kevin, I'm baffled by it, but do you see the point I'm making? Well, are you saying that the press on the right-hand side of the political spectrum are not happy and are suddenly crying foul? I mean, I, I, I think this is, you're casting aspersions front, which go beyond even your limits. I, I mean, as well as last time and uh, what, uh, what Nigel did to help Boris, uh, he also have to cast your mind back, and Joe will know this even better than, than the rest of us. Go back to 2015. And what did the Tories do to the Lib Dems? There they were in happy coalition, which, to be fair, the coalition worked in, in many respects. I mean, it did for it did for the Lib Dems, particularly in terms of tuition fees, but it worked. It, they got all the way to the end. Uh, the election came under, under the uh, Fixed Parliament Act. And what did Cameron do? He went absolutely for the Lib Dems in the sort of southwest, the Thames Valley, etc. Uh, and that's how he built his, uh, his majority in 2015. Uh, the Tory party has been the party. It's the most successful electoral machine in history across the world. It is probably the only party that has never called for a change to first past the post. Uh, and I think I'm right in saying, listeners will point me out if I'm if I'm wrong, the Tory party actually got a pretty good proportional uh, result in terms of its vote share to its, uh, its seat share. Obviously, it's different for Labour because Labour have done what we've been talking about. So the Tories actually got a fair result in many ways. Uh, but uh, hoist by your own petard, I think, is probably the phrase. Yes. And the other thing, Jim, when I was listening to a number of pollsters over the weekend and reading some of the broadsheets, pointed out that this idea that every reform vote would go to the Tories if reform stood down is absolute nonsense. In fact, the share is about 38 percent of reform voters would have voted Tory had there not been a reform candidate in their constituency. 19 percent would have voted Labour. So, again, a bit of a nonsense to suggest reform are just taking votes from the Conservatives. Yes, indeed. And I think also a lot of people voted for reform who wouldn't otherwise vote at all. Um, that's a bit of an echo from the EU referendum where a lot of people participated yeah. who wouldn't normally participate in politics. Yeah, um, good point. I, 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 I'm, I, I'm very interested in what Joe says about the Liberal Democrats. It, it's, it, it's, it's an interesting position that they're in because, in a way, I mean, this is a magnificent performance. Um, but you know, you could, if you were being harsh, say that they're they're impotent because they've they've got 72 MPs, but the Labour majority doesn't require any assistance from them. But Joe's hinted that there might be um, a, des a desire to sort of be more consensual and work together between. Um, Starmer and, uh, and and Sir Ed Davey and you know you sort of wonder you know in the longer term you know this Labour ascendancy won't be there forever that if if there is a sort of consensual working together because there's not much point in the Lib Dems going into by-elections now and, and sort of uh, doing some of the tactics which really wind up Labour M MPs that you know if there is a sort of a general support for the Labour program over the next few years and you know you look at the longer term of uh, what has bedeviled the left is the, the split between the Liberals and the Liberal Democrats and the, the Conservative and the Labour Party that there might be a coming together of those two in the face of whatever we're going to get on the right this is my point you know uh, we've already talked a little bit about reform but I just I, I don't know I mean Joe will probably say no but the Lib Liberal democracy is a distinctive uh, position from 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 what Labour stands for, and it's not on. But I'd just be interested in her view on that. 
a realignment of the left rather than a realignment of the right. It's, Joe, it's Jim's dream, I have to say to you, Joe. He's been banging on about this ever since I met him 30 odd years ago. Uh, but I think he does have a point. The one thing that I think may cause difficulties between the Lib Dems and the Labour Party is Labour's plans to reform the planning system. Because where Liberal Democrats have performed well in this election is in those constituencies where you will have an awful lot of NIMBYs. And of course, the initial reaction, the natural reaction, in a sense, from your local MP is to say, oh, no building on our green belt. So that's going to cause some challenges. Well, it might do. Let's see what Labour come up with. I mean, you know, they're talking about uh, reforming the planning system. They're looking at the grey belt, if you like. They're looking at stuff on the green belt, which is not rolling hills and beautiful fields. Mm. It's places where there's a scruffy old garage and, you know, some rundown buildings. There's also a huge impetus uh, to get stuff done in city centres um, where you've got empty shops, you've got empty retail outlets, you've got, you know, those sort of little industrial estates that you see dotted around the country. Now, if you bring in uh, tight controls that allows you to change the use from retail to residential and it meets the high standards, then you Im immediately reinvigorate town centres, which immediately uh, reinvigorates local businesses and all the rest of it. So let's see what they come up with. I was interested to see over the weekend that they're talking about Nick Bowles, who was a Tory uh, minister, planning and housing many years ago, um, of coming in to sort of help. He has apparently been talking to Labour behind the scenes about planning. And part of the problem is that, you know, whilst you've got developers who'll buy up a plot of land and go, hey, we're going to build these lovely houses here and we're going to do a primary school and a doctor's surgery. And then you get the CGI's of the mum with the pushchair and the dog and the balloons and somebody in a wheelchair and it all looks absolutely glorious. And what you end up with is a bundle of houses with absolutely no infrastructure, two cars for every house and nobody can get their kids into school or, or a dentist. So what they need to do is it's fine. And I think people wouldn't be so nimby-ish if they could see that the infrastructure was there to support new builds. I mean, I think everybody agrees we need new houses. What we don't need is these random estates of four and five bedroom houses. We need what Angela Rayner's talked about, you know, the old fashioned, if you like, the sort of Victorian Edwardian terraces um, in towns, but with access to green space, access to shops, you know, handy for transport. If you start building where there's transport hubs, you immediately begin to make planning much more sensible. Greater powers for councils to CPO as well, Joe, for some of these developers yeah, who just land back. And Let's I think just, just, uh, sorry, just Joe, to go, yeah. sorry, just just to go on to that point, where you've got Lib Dems in local authorities, I think that's a way that they can work with Labour because if Labour are sensible about what they want to do about planning and they can sell it to local authorities that have got Lib Dem uh, majorities or, or shared majorities, then you've got a better chance of getting it through. The problem is that you get developers, as you say, sitting on it, land banking, whilst it goes through the endlessly slow process of appeals, which doesn't help anybody apart from the developers. Absolutely. Let's move on to reform then. We've spoke about it briefly in terms of Farage. They ended up with five seats and talk of potentially a realignment of the right, although increasingly I'm hearing Conservative voices saying we don't want anything to do with Nigel Farage. Uh, the other thing, Kevin, that's been pointed out by a number of commentators over the weekend is we have been here before, albeit through European elections and, you know, uh, other people elected to Parliament who were working alongside Nigel Farage for about five minutes and they find that, you know, more <laughs> his ego sort of gets in the way uh, of party management. What do you think the future for reform holds, Kevin? Are they going to be eaten up by the Conservatives? Are they going to continue this idea of, a reverse takeover of the Tory party, or is it all going to implode as Lee Anderson, Richard Tice and Nigel Farage find that there can only be one leader of the party? Well, I think that's that's the key problem for them, isn't it? It, it really is a one-man band. I mean, obviously, Richard Tice has played a, an important part, not least with cash. Uh, but I think what you point point to in terms of Europe is, is significant, I think, because... 
Nigel did not have a great reputation for doing his work while he was in Brussels. I think he used the expense account quite well, and he could probably give us all a few tips on restaurants in and around Brussels. But um, he wasn't particularly good, I think, if my memory serves, at turning up committees and doing the sort of the boring hard yards of politics and what elected representatives are there to do. And in Brussels, of course, you can get away with it because none of us understood what was going on and it all looked one massive gravy train. So uh, is he going to turn up? Uh, is going to turn up to the House of Commons when his mate across the pond is trying to get elected and he's supposed to be over there holding rallies and doing introductions or whatever else. So that'll be quite interesting to see how much time he's uh, on this side of the pond in the, in the run up to November 2. Um, and does he turn up? He won't have too many select committees that they'll get in terms of having five seats in the House of Commons. But uh, what about the constituency work? Is he going to do uh, all of that with all his other uh, colleagues is for the colleagues Lee Anderson of course is used to it to be fair to him but the other three will be new to it will he do the boring stuff when people want to go and talk about potholes and housing and schools and so on in Clacton I noticed in his acceptance speech he talked about bringing private investment to Clacton and all kinds of other things well let's let's see how that goes uh, I think we, we'll move on to this I'm sure Frank we talk about media in sort of more general terms but uh is he going to get scrutinised by the media? That's the thing now. Is he just going to be a sort of mouthpiece for the Daily Express, for GB News, for the Daily Mail, etc.? Uh, or are the media going to scrutinise him along with every other elected representative? I think that's one of the key things. What's he going to do in parliamentary terms as, a, as, a, as an MP? Uh, and are they going to be all their sort of rhetoric be subject now to scrutiny now that they've got a body of MPs in the House? Jim, what are you making of reform? Well, I mean, the, the, the big issue is um, what is going to happen on the right? I mean, this is partly why I floated this business about left free alignment, because it, we just don't know at the moment who's going to win the battle in the Tory party about what to do about uh, reform. I mean, you know, Sir Edward Lee, who by signing in a few seconds before Jeremy Corbyn in 1983 is the father of the House, has overtly called this weekend for uh, Nigel Farage to be embraced by the Conservative Party and quotes, if he stood for leader, it would be up to the members to decide whether he became leader of our party. So that's that's one view. Um, there are other views, obviously, which want nothing to do with what they call a, 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 a racist and uh, who would actually destroy the whole ethos of the Conservative Party. So in a sense, we've got to see what happens. I know we don't want to particularly talk about the Tories today because we did that on the weekend. Um, you know, what is going to happen about that? And let's let's presume for a moment that the rejectionists in the Conservative Party win. Then I think everything that, um, that, that Kevin has said is, is is absolutely valid. But that is a is a crucial issue, uh, I think. And, and of course, um, you know, reform seem to be at the moment formally committed to that happening. The other thing is immigration. That's what fuels Farage to some extent. And, you know, it's one of the major challenges for the Labour government. If Farage can continually gnaw on the bone of boat people continuing to come across, and Yvette Cooper doesn't get to grasp with it, that gives them the that gives them the engine for for for, for why they exist. So I think those are the two key things. And Kevin mentions the cash that Tice has given the party. I mean, you know, um, to support uh, right wing, uh, I'm quite fascinated by this because I mean, I'm, I'm not making a direct comparison. It's not fair, but obviously the the uh, National Socialists in Germany before the Second World War did get substantial backing from Krupp and, and major business finance and so on. But I mean, as far as I can tell, business, you know, in the conventional sense that we know it, want nothing to do with reform. <clears throat> but you do need money to, 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 to make I mean, if, if they're serious about becoming, you know, wiping out the Tories and becoming the opposition, you need a lot of money. So those are the those are the key issues for me about reform. Suella Bravman has indicated over the weekend, Joe, that she's likely to join reform if there is yeah. not this accommodation by the Tory party for Nigel and co. Well, I'm sure there are some people in the Conservative Party who wish she'd joined a long time ago. I mean, <laughs> you know, she is she that woman is so lacking in self-awareness it's astonishing you know she did this huge big piece in the Sunday papers about how the Tories deserve to lose and you think yes but you were part of it you know you're supposed to be a lawyer you're supposed to have been the Attorney General and quite a lot of the things that she wanted to bring in have been found to be illegal um, and she's just banging on I mean I think that a couple of things one is that when you're talking about the reform votes what was interesting and you're absolutely right they 
they didn't just take them from the Conservatives. But what they did do is they did well in places that had vote leave. So clearly there is that uh, undercurrent, which I think plays into the, the immigration thing. And we've also seen um, the Sunday Telegraph yesterday and the Mail banging on about, oh, you know, Labour Party is going to get us back into the EU by the back door, which, of course, is absolute nonsense. But I think you're absolutely right. You know, immigration is a big problem and it's a big issue and it's going to be a huge challenge uh, for Yvette Cooper and her team. But, you know, we know Rwanda is now dead in the water. Well, it was dead in the water before it started, but we might have saved quite a lot of money if we hadn't gone down the road of Rishi Sunak's ridiculous ideas and Suella Bravma. Um, I think reform might fizzle out. Um, I mean, you know, don't forget, back in the day, there were UKIP councillors, um, I mean, where I'm speaking to you from in East Kent, they, they were elected to the local council, they lasted about five minutes because they were completely and utterly incompetent. Um, and whilst Nigel Farage is a very good media communicator, and so is um, Tice up to a point, um, they've still got to, as you say, deliver on the potholes, the housing, the planning, and those sort of things. So who are their staff going to be? Because if you get somebody, let's say you get um, a young Muslim family turning up in Clacton with a housing issue, are they going to be treated sympathetically? I don't know. What worried me terribly over the weekend is this um, survey that showed that apparently Nigel Farage is very appealing to teenage boys and likened himself to um, that dreadful, dreadful man who mercifully I've completely Andrew, T Andrew Tate. Andrew Tate. Um, and I had quite a stonking row on GB News saying, you know, this is really, really dangerous. I mean, anything that engages young people with politics is good. But this is really dangerous because if somebody like Farage is going down that path of saying, oh, it's all right, you can go and watch football, you can have a few pints, you can make jokes about the Germans. We're going back to the dark ages when blokes think it's all right to grab a woman's breast and say, oh, get over yourself, love. It's a bit of banter. Yeah, I saw some reports that indicated that, you know, young people, they, they have got a, a sort of young following, haven't they? Um, reform in certain That's places, funny. which is quite frightening in one sense. We wait and see how the whole reform story uh, rewinds because I unwind, sorry, because I, I tend to think that Farage will find it difficult to... It, it's not the sexiest of jobs being an MP. Um, and he's got Washington calling, as Kevin's indicated. You know, his mate Trump will be saying, come on, Nige, let's do a tour of the states. Clacton versus New York versus Chicago versus San Francisco. I don't know. I, I think it might all end in tears. But it will be interesting to see what the Conservatives do in terms of their relationship with Farage. And so let's move on to the other story of the night, I suppose, which was the SNP's implosion. And Kevin, I think that we all anticipated a poor result for the Scottish Nationalists, but we didn't expect them to lose as many seats as they eventually did. No, I don't think probably any of us did. And certainly, you know, when we saw that exit poll, uh, I think those three three exit poll predictions were all quite surprising, weren't they? The Lib Dems, who had even higher uh, reform that we've touched on, and, and SNP, and the SNP, I think they were one out, I think, on the exit poll, weren't they? Yeah, I think that's right. I think it also points to, uh, I mean, uh, there are many factors, but a couple I'd point to. One is that Labour have become particularly effective north of the border. I wouldn't say they've returned to their previous heights in the sort of Gordon Brown era and before, Donald Dewar, etc. Uh, but they've returned to something like it. They've got a leader who seems to be having, a, a, seems to have a bit of a grip. He's got a good relationship with Starmer. Uh, the machines seem to work well. Um, so I think that was one thing. But the other point is the same as the tools, isn't it? If you're incompetent, if it looks like you're out of control, if your leader only lasts a few weeks, if you've got people who are you know, not convicted of anything yet, but people in senior positions who look like they've been doing something a bit odd, let's just leave it at that. Um, if, you know, we know that the public services and so on are not quite where they should be, even though 
uh, the SNP talks a good game about their investment in public services and their, uh, you know, higher education, etc., uh, being free at the point of use. Um, if you're incompetent, if it looks like you haven't got a got a grip, if it looks like there's some odd things going on, if it looks like you know, particularly of a gender reform, uh, gender gender rec- recognition, I should say, uh, if it looks like you've got a split over some key policies which are taking too much of the the volume away from other issues. Uh, you're going to get damaged by um, the electorate. Uh, and so they were double whammied, weren't they? Double whammied by Labour because of the Tories, trying to get the Tories out, double whammied because of their own incompetence. And it looks like they've been in power for too long and they've forgotten what they're there for. And I think the fundamental thing, with some similarities to reform, the fundamental thing is if the SNP is all about independence, independence has gone away again. It was looking like it could have got even post-2014 uh, 20, uh, referendum, looked like it could have been swinging back. It looked like Wales was even, you know, heading a bit further in that direction than previously. Obviously, what's happening on the uh, island of Ireland, it, it looked like, you know, we could be we could be just left with just England. That seems to have gone away quite a bit. But if you're just about independence, how do you align that with, you know, running a government and, you know, they've got sort of left right divisions within the, within the SNP family. So a bit like the Tories, they've got to work out what they're about and what they're for and where independence sits clearly you know line one page one of the manifesto and all of that how that sits with the rest of their policy agenda and are they delivering and in the end voters care about delivering and as samuel said over the weekend the change message was as appropriate in scotland as it was in england jim and i think he was proved right he has he's been an impressive character himself the leader of the scottish labour party the other thing I would say is that there may be some lessons to be learned um, from for Starmer and the Labour government in terms of the issues that the SNP got themselves embroiled in. Almost an arrogance being in for that long that they think that you know the gender recognition issue, for example, uh, it started to look like a bit of a one party state and they paid the price heavily, Jim, haven't they? Yes, I mean, the comparisons with the Conservative Party are very strong. Uh, you know, um, I think they, they had been in a long time. They had a bit of an iffy record on health and education. Um, they did become embroiled, as Kevin has so elegantly said, in odd things, uh, you know, with uh, Nicola Sturgeon and, and the row with um, uh, previously the Alex Salmond, all that sort of distraction stuff as well. Um, and and in, in a sense, it wasn't because of this, the Scots have lost their appetite for independence because support for independence as a concept has remained strong. However, I do agree with Kevin that it's off the agenda for now. Um, and it's interesting, you know, the United Kingdom is a, we, we regard it as a sort of stable, the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, we regard as a fairly stable state. In some ways it isn't because just as the Scottish independence issue has been put to bed, I don't know whether we are going to talk very much about it, but Sinn Féin have, have, have had another victory in the in 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 Northern Ireland. They didn't do so well in the Southern Ireland elections. Um, and you know, at some point uh, there, you saw the DUP, who've had their issues. They've been sort of in power for for quite a long time, and they've had their issues with Donaldson uh, being on charges, which he denies. So you've got this sort of pattern, really. And so the issue of Irish um, uh, unity might begin to come up again. Last thing I wanted to say is that uh, it's quite striking this morning that Kate Forbes, who's the deputy leader of the SNP, was very consensual about Labour on an interview. And uh, one got a a sense from her, certainly, that she wants to cool it on independence and actually see what she can get out of a a Labour government. And the last thing is that Labour's big mistake over the years was to take Scotland for granted. Mm. All the best talent headed off to London you know there was an implication that Gordon Brown and Douglas Alexander and people like that who's now back of course would make their careers in 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 London and not in the backwater of Scotland Anasawa has got to keep uh, Keir Starmer focused on saying Scotland does matter John sorry go on Kevin I'm just going to add that I mean one might say that the SNP has run a very successful strategy in the fact that all its MPs can now fit in a camper van (laughs) 
<laughs> Excellent. Boom, boom. Zinger. Zinger of the day. <laughs> yeah, Joe, Jim referenced that uh, Kate Forbes have been quite complimentary about the new Labour government. I noticed that John Swinney and Keir Starmer met yesterday, Sunday. And again, it seemed to be quite a constructive meeting. John Swinney accepting that, you know, his, his party has had a bad night. Uh, I think uh, a far better response from John Swinney and Kate Forbes than some of the Conservatives I've heard uh, in terms of uh, the defeat that they suffered. Uh, SNP, uh, are they now just basically going to go back to the drawing board, do you think? Yeah, probably. I mean, I think it's significant that, that you know, Scotland was the first place that Keir Starmer decided to go to. Um, you know, he didn't have to do this whirlwind tour of Britain. He's off to Washington uh, today. Um, he's got a hugely busy week. Um, so I sort of think, you know, that was in itself was significant. And I think Labour recognises that, you know, as you said, they took the Scottish votes for granted. But that it seems to be the pattern. That's what the SNP yeah. did. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's what the Tories did. To a certain extent, it's what Labour did um, after Tony Blair and until um, Gordon Brown came in. So I think the SNP, you know, they've got to, as Kevin said, they've got to have more than independence. Uh, but what is that more? Because when they hadn't got independence, they were, you know, going down rabbit holes of gender recognition and things like that and failing to deal with health and education and other issues. So I think, you know, we'll see what happens. Um, they need to probably go away, lick their wounds, regroup and think about what matters. And it may be that, you know, in the next decade, some of these parties that started off as single issues actually merge into something else or they link up with Labour or, you know, they become something entirely different. I mean, you know, the Greens didn't do anything in Scotland. So where does that fit, for instance? Um, you know, Reform didn't do anything in Scotland. I'm not sure that they even put up any candidates. But, you know, there are other issues. And we've what we're seeing is not as John Prescott famously said, a realignment of the Teutonic plates of British politics. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, you've nice, nicely segued into the Greens there, Joe, and I'll stay with you for a comment on them. Uh, four seats, um, and so a better performance than they've had previously. Uh, I think that the seats that they've won quite similar in terms of the constituencies that one well, is that right or wrong well i think uh, brighton they they retained which of course caroline lucas has held for many many years so that was expected bristol where um carla denya the co-leader of the greens took from labor from thangham debonair um they've you know they've got a strong local base and she's worked hard at it i think the one standout for me uh was ellie chowns winning in hertford uh, herefordshire north um unseating bill wiggins who had been the tory mp for you know 20 years and had a majority of around twenty five thousand. Yeah. um and again you know it's about working the ground laying the groundwork she's a local councillor she's got good stuff and I think, you know, I think also the Liberal Democrats have been beneficiaries of green votes where green voters have seen that the Liberal Democrats could get rid of a Tory. Um, because there is no doubt that apart, you know, if, if you put to one side and put them in a box or in Kevin's camper van, the climate change deniers um, and the, you know, the gas guzzlers and the, you know, let's frack, let's build, let's do all the rest of it. I think an, there is a huge number of people who really care about environmental issues, which, you know, whether it's sewage in the seas and rivers or whether it's building or whether it's climate change and the wider picture. Um, and just going back to briefly to the that survey about young people, whilst young boys appear to go for Nigel Farage, young girls are very, very green. So, you know, this might be the future. And as well as the four Greens that were elected, Kevin, I do, just on the Greens, I think if they want to be seen as being a serious party moving forward, then they do need to sort out this co-leader thing. I mean, what, what do you think? If you're a party of four MPs and you've got two leaders, what are the other two thinking? Um, <laughs> well, anyway, we, we, we leave, we leave, leave that aside for now. Um, well, but presumably... 
Presumably, they're going to be co-deputy leaders, aren't they? <laughs> well, that's what I was, I was sort of thinking that, but hey, you know. Um, and then we've got these five independents. <laughs> they obviously, you know, the, the clue is in the name. They are independents. But the one thing, the issue they will coalesce around, I guess, is the Palestinian issue. And again, they won't have a leader formally, but Jeremy Corbyn, the most high profile, of those independents. Now, I remember it wasn't that long ago that we were sat here thinking that George Galloway was going to burst into the House of Commons and start <laughs> creating absolute havoc on Palestine. I do wonder whether we overestimate the influence that a single MP that independents can have, even if he got the sort of profile that Corbyn's got. Well, I think, I mean, a couple of things that immediately spring to mind. Uh, one is, if I can just go back to reform for one second, uh, and we were we're all questioning uh, Nigel Farage and how reform we're going to do, but one has to give him credit, uh, if credit is the word, because probably without him, Brexit would not have happened. And that has had a massive impact economically, as I think we all agree, and in many other ways, for the last eight years since that referendum and before it, it you know, it chucked Cameron uh you know in uh, overboard really by himself doing something that george osborne and others told him not to do um and you've got to give nigel credit because he was sort of in the wilderness got his sort of gb news gig uh but there he was out on a boat doing videos for twitter uh, you know uh, doing the small boat crisis and it's become you know one of the most significant issues that has had an impact certainly on this election and which is takes over the the sort of national conversation. I'm not saying it's not an issue, but he, he has uh, exposed it, if you like, bumped it up and benefited from it. And therefore, I think, you know, Greens, Caroline did a very good job for the Greens, one MP, but she was pretty effective in the House of Commons, pretty well respected, was a voice that was uh, that the Speaker found quite a few times. Um, you could imagine if he hadn't thrown it away, George Galloway might have done the same had he been there for a, a bit longer. Nigel might do it not might do it now, now that he is an MP. Uh, as you say, we've got Jeremy Corbyn back in, who knows the ropes, obviously. He's got, we've got these other five independents who coalesce in one way or another around the Ga uh, Gaza issue or um, representative of the Muslim vote. There's some interesting stats about where there's a, a large number of, proportionally large number of Muslim voters in a constituency, the impact that that can have and why these these. Uh, new MPs have got in. So I think we've got to be careful. It, it, there we are with Labour, 412 uh, seats, and they think they can rule the roost. The Tories in disarray. Uh, but uh, there's a lot of these kind of single issue uh, campaigns, if you like, whether that's, you know, small boats, green issues, uh, Gaza and the wider sort of Muslim issues. Uh, uh, Scotland, we, we know about. They came very successful on the independence issue. So I think we, I think Labour have got to think, carefully about how they handle what might seem single issue and might seem some odd characters if we put it that way uh, i think they've got to think carefully about that because you know the odd uh, voice off to the left or to the right or wherever can suddenly hold an awful lot of traction not least uh, with the kind of media landscape we have both traditional media and social media so i, I I'd be careful not to be too dismissive, not least because uh, a lot of the people we're talking about have got particularly, um, you know, appropriate issues that they want to pursue. Jim, independents and Greens, what's your view? Do you think they're going to make a major impact on the next parliament? I think the Greens could become quite an attractive alternative because uh, for people on the left of Labour, because um, a lot of the more social uh, uh, aspects of green policy are, can be very comfortably accommodated uh, by people on the left of the Labour Party and uh, so I think that is certainly something to be um, for Labour to be concerned about you know in the protest by-elections and so on uh, I could see the sort of the, uh, the uh, what's still called the Corbynite left uh, could be attracted to the Greens uh, the Greens have got to be careful to focus on you know the issues that are important to people um, you know there was a thing up on their website about rationing meat and things like that they need to be careful about kooky ideas and, and discrediting their overall message which is important i mean you know it's already already it looks as if this year is going to be the hottest year on record you know climate change is a, is a real issue and uh, people tend to put it on the back burner in their considerations but it is it is coming to threaten us all so that that is that is important but they just need to be careful on that 
on the independence, I mean, let's just just take a swipe at Galloway. I mean, if you look at Galloway, I, I don't sure he turned up to the House of Commons more than once or twice since he was MP for Rochester. I know he wasn't there very long. A complete dilettante, he lounged in a hotel rather than doing the courtesy to turn up at the count. And compare him with when Martin Bell was the uh, independent MP for Tatton, you know, really made a mark. So in independence can make a mark. Um, uh, the other thing about these independents, I mean, they're very disparate. There's an independent from Northern Ireland who got nothing to do with the other independents. And, and, and then we come to Jeremy Corbyn. Jeremy Corbyn, comfortable with uh, some of the views that perhaps some of these people that regard Gaza as very important have about the role of women. You know, there are a lot of issues there to be considered. And as I said on Saturday, uh, I fully respect uh, the, the view of people about, about Gaza, but there has been a toxicity introduced into our uh, into our into our um, democratic process, which needs to needs to go away. There's a way of addressing the issue without some of the intimidation that we've seen. So we'll we'll we'll, we'll see what happens with the independents. I mean, they've all sort of stood independent of each other. Um, whether there's any sort of grouping together of the particularly the people who stood on Gaza, I, I I don't know. But you know, they were there, and the West Streeting thing was a was a mighty shock. Five hundred votes would have taken out potentially the next leader of the Labour Party. So it. You know, it's going to be an issue for as long as that tortured country continues. You know, there needs to be what there needs to be is more international attention, um, the heft of the international community, and perhaps our Russian and Chinese friends are accepting their global responsibilities to bring their skills on board to actually try and bring peace in that tortured land. And it did take out Jonathan Ashworth, which again we, we spoke about on on Saturday. Right, that's before we close the first segment of the podcast today. The first 72 hours, Starmer has definitely hit the ground running. Uh, we've mentioned his visit to Scotland. He's going to Ireland and Wales today, I understand. He's meeting the Metro Mayors tomorrow, I think, which signals the importance he sees decentralisation and devolution playing in terms of some of the delivery uh, he wants to make. And then he's off to Washington. So, it has been a bit of a whirlwind 72 hours. The other thing he's done, interestingly, is some of these external appointments. We touched upon James Timpson on Saturday. Uh, I noticed Alan Milburn is back helping Wes as health. I think that's a tremendous appointment. Jackie Smith has been appointed to the Lords in order mm. to undertake a role in education. I was a bit surprised by that, but mm. there you go. Um, but a good start, I think, Kevin, to Starmer's Premiership. Yeah, a very good start. I think, you know, two things I'd, I'd touch on. One is they put the groundwork in, haven't they? They really, you know, I can't remember who it was now on the BBC election programme on the night. It was Somebody was having a go at Sue Gray. I thought, you know, leave it alone, would you? I mean, Sue Gray and other people in and around the Starmer operation have put this together, you know, the first two weeks, the first hundred days, you know, Lammy going out, John Healy going out to Ukraine, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, you know, these things don't just happen overnight. I mean, they did happen overnight, but <laughs> they don't <laughs> arise overnight. Um, I think so. I think that's been Im impressive. He's clearly thought about. I mean, the cabinet was relatively easy, apart from the two other appointments he had to make. The interesting appointment on Attorney General, uh, which seems to be a good one, and the kind of advisors, as you say, Joe, Joe touched on Nick Bowles and, among others. The other thing I'd say is. Um, uh, and I sort of predicted this, and I'm hoping this turns out to be right over the long term, not just one-off. I, I thought Starmer, A, did a good uh, speech outside number 10 on Friday, as we talked about, but also I thought his press conference, uh, I saw up sort of half and then yes. had to sort of listen to the rest, but I thought his press conference, he, he seemed pretty relaxed. He, uh, he, you know, he was there making points. It wasn't just a load of old waffle. He was talking through what he's doing, uh, what he's done and what he's doing. Uh, and I thought notably, as far as I could tell, he took all the questions and what had been happening, particularly with a lot of Tory prime ministers, they've got their list. Of course, they've got to go to their list, got to go to Chris Mason first, etc. Although, you know, it's with Farage and others, they often used to go to GB News first. I wonder why. Uh, but they've got to go through their list and, and particularly knock off the broadcasters first. But he, he seemed to take questions from anywhere. He seemed comfortable, re relatively comfortable doing it. I'm not saying he didn't avoid the question here or there or any half answer a question here or there, but that's kind of fine to a degree i thought he, he looked uh you know a bit more comfortable in the in the role i'm not saying he suddenly turned into tony blair or anything um and i think he's going to grow into it because he you know he's a man on a mission or five missions and uh he's going to pursue it i think and um he won't get an easy ride from you know some of the daily mail type press but 
uh, if you're doing things and making things happen and you're doing things in a sort of proper and cogent and coherent way, it's going to be harder for the Daily Mail and Daily Express to attack uh, attack you. So um, they'll hit, you know, bumps in the road, etc. not least on planning. But uh, I'd say, yeah, as good a start as you could probably hope. Joe? Yeah, I think he looked like a man transformed, actually. He, he His face relaxed. He'd lost that tension and he looked like the Keir Starmer that people who know him say he is. He lost that rather sort of staid, rigid um, grey. He even looked like he'd got sort of colour in his cheeks, probably exhaustion, I expect. No, I think they've, they've done well. I mean, Rachel Reeves is making her face first major speech today as chancellor i think that will be significant and i think you know it's important to note that the markets have remained fairly steady there hasn't been a, a collapse um in business or economic confidence and as kevin says you know there are going to be bumps in the road of course there are um you can't do things overnight as we've already discussed um but i think people know that and i think you know what keir starmer has done is manage expectations so, you know, you change the tone, you look like you're doing stuff, you look like you know what you're doing, you're not arguing with each other. Um, and just to go back a little bit, I think what will be the next interesting appointments, and I don't think they've come out yet, are the whips who, of course, control and look after and keep the MPs in order, because with such a huge majority, you know, you get disgruntled people, they're a bit ignored, they're a bit bored, they're a long way from home. It's very easy to coalesce around a voice like Jeremy Corbyn or another independent. Um, so I think the whips will have their work cut out as well on, on party discipline. Yeah, but so junior, far so good. Junior appointments not being made yet, or many of them certainly haven't. Jim, you made the point earlier about the importance of immigration. It was interesting that Eva Cooper was out on the front foot on that issue. Trashing Rwanda as Keir Starmer, the, the Rwanda policy as uh, Keir Starmer did at his press conference, and then saying we're going to invest in this new border force and we're looking for a commander. We're out there. We're going to, I think, have a high profile person. And I suspect somebody who's going to have profile, who's going to be the voice on immigration. And I think what Labour are going to start to do, and politicians, if they were honest, should have been doing this for the past decade, actually, is the nuance in terms of this discussion and debate and the difference between illegal immigration and the immigration that this country needs to just function as an economy. And I think that that sort of narrative began to be formed by Yvette Cooper in her first address to the media over the weekend thought it was good but as i say i think this appointment of a a commissioner or a commander and i think they'll say right you're, you're going to front this for us and you're going to be talking to the media that sort of makes it a bit less political potentially which is no bad thing because it's just become such a toxic issue where you cannot have a reasonable informed discussion Immigration, as you say, Jim, big, big issue, but it's not been handled in any serious sense for years and years now. No, it, it hasn't. But, uh, you know, I, I just remain a, a sceptic about it. I, I, absolutely, it's the right time for a, a government, given this majority, to have a sensible conversation with the British people about the, the need that we have for uh, immigration uh, in certain sectors. But overall, uh, I, I still feel there's an underlying and a major feeling uh, in Britain that we haven't got control of our borders and that uh, services are put under stress by the number of people coming into the country. I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but I do think it's there. And I'm not entirely convinced that an appointment of a commissioner is going to take the weight off Yvette Cooper. It sounds to me like uh, trying to shift responsibility away. What will matter is whether it's seen to be under control and whether the government can win the argument about the value of certain types of, uh, of, of immigration. I mean, as far as things in general are concerned, it's now becoming very clear that Sue Gray, using her contacts, has had very detailed discussions with a lot of civil servants. Um, these ministers coming in have been well well prepped and by meeting the civil service so that there won't be a long delay in the civil service actually implementing the the, the, the policy. Um, Keir Starmer him, himself is driven by 
results rather than ideology. People look around and despair. What's his ideology? What does he believe in? It slightly misses the point. He's a lawyer. He loves the <laughs> detail. He wants to deliver results. So if he lacks an ideology, it won't matter if he can deliver. But of course, you know, if something major goes wrong, we might see that frightened stare return. But we'll, we'll, we'll just have to see. Just finally, um, I do, you know, uh, the hysteria about Europe in the Mail on Sunday yesterday, you know, <laughs> The, the very thought that this government should have the temerity to seek to make it easier for young people to go and, and spend time in Europe is, 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 you know, betrayal of the national interests and so on. It's just nonsense. And I, and I really hope that Starmer shows courage in the face of that in, in trying to be a bit more friendly to our European colleagues. Can, can well, I just come Jim, back on? Ever, you give me a great segue into the next part of our discussion, which is Europe and it's France and the French elections. Sorry for cutting you off there, Kevin. We'll come back to you in a moment. But let's take a short break. And uh, when we come back, as I say, we'll be discussing uh, those uh, French elections that were caused by Emmanuel Macron throwing his toys out the pram after the European elections a few weeks ago. And we didn't get the right wing uh, result that we anticipated. So stay with us, as I say, back in a sec. Hi, this is Frank McKenna, the Chief Executive Group Chair of Downtown in Business. I'm delighted to announce that uh, in association with the Northern Power Towns organisation, we're organising a very special conference, Birchwood in Warrington, on Friday the 12th of July looking at that very subject, focusing on Northern Power Towns, how we get our towns economically growing, how our towns can contribute to UK PLC. There'll be about 20 local authority executives in the room. We've got private sector partners from across the north of the country coming into the room and contributing too. So if you want to be with us for that conference, it's free to attend. Go to our website, that's all the W's downtownandbusiness.com to the events section and have a look at that Northern Power Towns Conference, 12th of July, Warrington, and register your place today. Okay, welcome back to the second part of today's Downtown Den Politics podcast. And we're going to move to international affairs and the French election it was anticipated following the first round of results a couple of weeks ago a week ago actually uh the national rally uh, marine le pen's party the right-wing nationalist party uh were going to win the former government uh, as it transpired they didn't even finish second they finished third in the poll the socialist left-wing alliance have won and macron's party have finished second i know that You've been following this election with at least one eye on it, James, between going to Silverstone and Wimbledon and <laughs> this high life that you as an international playboy have. Uh, what's your take on the French election? Has Macron's gamble at least in par paid off, do you think? Well, it, he put down a challenge to the French people. Do you really want, you know, what they did in the European Parliament elections? Do you really want this? And the French people have blinked uh, at that prospect as they always have done of course we've seen election runoffs in the presidential elections before where the french people have been faced with uh, i think it was mr le pen years ago versus a more conventional politician and the, the french people there is obviously a consensus that they don't want it but i i must say you know i'm i'm relieved because i i thought what went on last week it's a bit complicated but they have these departments which is our, like our constituencies and there were an awful lot of them where there was potentially going to be three candidates, uh, which might have allowed uh, National Rally to win more. But by standing down uh, candidates and just having one alternative to National Rally, it seems to have succeeded in, in creating this. So um, uh, I, I thought the French people might resent being manipulated like that, but uh, they clearly have made their choices. And um, they've obviously, you know, the, the largest party is this, uh, socialist left but it's a, it's a pretty broad 
left and i'm not sure how long it's going to survive because it runs from the communists to the sort of soft left so we'll see how long that lasts the french prime minister has resigned he was a i think a, a macron person i'm yeah. not quite sure about that yes yeah. so and the and we talked about the markets staying stable in this country the markets today in france have fallen the business is a bit worried about what's going to happen next i think that there'll be relief uh, across europe though because Whatever happened in that election, Macron was going to stay president. And although this is going to be a difficult coalition to hold together at governmental level, he's not got the sniping from a right wing government that would have been saying things like, let's abandon Ukraine, let's renegotiate our relationship with the European Union. So it's given some relief in that regard, Joe. Nevertheless, you know, we complain about the vagaries of our electoral system. Wow, I looked at that last night and I thought, is this really the mess that you want to get into? OK, it's more proportional. But dear me, not only if the market's going to be spooked, but investors are going to be looking at UK PLC, maybe a good thing for Starmer, and thinking, actually, that's where the stability is going to be over the next five years. Yeah. It's a bit of a mess, isn't it, Joe? It's a bit of a mess. I think the only thing we avoided was a penalty shootout. But I mean, you've got, <laughs> you know, as Jim said, um, you've got these extreme left wing voices. Um, you've got total instability and chaos. Um, and the prime minister, as Jim said, has resigned, but has said he'll stay on until after the Olympics, which is you know, imminent. Um, what I thought was interesting was the um, the young man who would have been pres uh, prime minister um, had Marie Le Pen won, um, Barolo, the 28 year old, straight out of the Trump playbook in his speech yesterday. This was fake news. This was, you know, we've had our, our right has been stolen. Democracy has been cheated. And you think this is really dangerous because what you've got is if you've got people like him, young people, and you've got them in Europe, not just you know lurking around the White House saying, we didn't win, we were cheated, then you begin to lose faith in democracy. And I think that's very damaging. But I do think um, you know, 10 million people voted for Marie Le Pen. You can't ignore them. It's exactly the same as we've had in this country with leave and remain and reform, which we've been talking about. But what you have got now is a period of total chaos in France for the time being. And that's going to make it very hard for Yvette Cooper, for instance, to have any sensible conversations about immigration. It's going to make it quite difficult to have conversations about closer trade um, or other um, deals with Europe. And, you know, it is not just France. You've got the rise of the right populism across Europe, um, you know, against the backdrop of Ukraine, which is going on and no signs of ending. So I think we, you know, we may well be a beacon of stability in a very unstable world, but it's not going to make life easier for Keir Starmer's government if you've got a Europe in turmoil and particularly our closest neighbour, France. Kevin, your take on it? I mean, what struck me when I was watching the results, the exit poll come in yesterday was the number of young people, young black people predominantly on the streets in absolute tears of relief at the fact that National Rally hadn't won. And listen, the instability isn't a great thing for France. This socialist alliance looks very unstable. But the one thing, as Jim mentioned, that Macron has proved is that there is no appetite to allow an extreme right wing populist party to be put in charge of government in France. For that, I think we should all be slightly relieved. Yes, uh, but I do think, so, touching on that point and what Joe was just saying, I do think, you know, the mainstream of politics uh, and people with political views does need to really, really think about how it's going to deal with the sort of populist affront. Uh, and we know it here, you know, Farage doesn't quite fit into the same populist narrative as some of the other, particularly in um, France with Marie Le Pen's outfit. But, you know, the rise of populism, Trump, obviously, we all know about in America and beyond. Um, I don't think the mainstream of politics, the sort of centre ground left and right, has really come to terms with how do you how do you take that on? And in particular, how do you take on the sort of younger versions who are attracted to Farage, our TikTok and I'm a celebrity, those who have been attracted to Marie Le Pen's you know, good looking bloke uh, who would have been PM, etc. We haven't got to grips with that. And if we don't get to grips with it, 
I mean, I think that is really troubling if we don't. Uh, secondly, I'd say, uh, you know, there's no perfect system, is there? Here are we, the, the, the debate we had at the top was all about, you know, the sort of fairness of the result and what the Tories and others think about that. And Labour got too many seats for the share of the vote, etc. And there we are in France. Oh, it's, a, it's an unholy mess. How's Macron going to find his way through that appoint a PM and get some kind of coherent government? Uh, the the point there is that there are, there isn't just left and right anymore, is there? Is there? And as we can see, you know, very colourfully in France, it goes from the extreme left to the very extreme right, and they sort of come back round on each other. Uh, how do we deal with that in both political systems and in, in and in sort of political debate? Uh, I think you know none of us, no country has got right, and that's just getting more complicated. Thirdly, I'd say. Uh, you know, here are we talking about Starmer not being the most charismatic, although improved already since becoming PM. Uh, you know, people talk about robotic, etc. Well, we've got Macron, who's a great political communicator, uh, modelled himself to some degree on Blair, I think. Uh, looks great, all of that. Um, not successful, not delivering, got a mess on his hands. So, um, you know, being a great political communicator and looking marvellous in a suit wandering about doesn't get you everywhere, does it, uh, as the results attest. And finally, just, you know, to come back round to immigration, a point Joe makes uh, about what uh, Yvette Cooper is going to be able to fathom out of sort of cross-border cooperation. Uh, you know, Jim was scathing about uh, a border command. And I think what some of the election, election results and the, you know, the results being given out on the night prove is you should not dismiss the power and quality of a man or woman in a very fancy hat or a very fancy official costume. <laughs> There's a lot to be said for a man in an impressive cap, Jim. That's all. <laughs> yeah, there were some fabulous outfits from returning officers on Thursday evening, Friday morning, I have to say. And just coming back to that point about electoral systems, I did intend to make this... Uh, observation in the first part of our conversation. It's the first time that over four parties in the UK uh, had scored 10%, 5%. And so, you know, so it was very much so a, a multi party contest, the general election in the UK this time around. Before we close, just a quick word on Joe Biden's continued travails. We did mention this briefly on Saturday. Uh, over the weekend, there's been continued speculation that he's going to be almost forced to stand out, which I think it'd be a shame. It'd be much better if he voluntarily came forward. But the Democratic Party seems to me to be now split asunder. Uh, donors have started to switch the cash into um, Senate races rather than the presidential race. People are now saying Camilla Harris would be a better candidate to put forward than Joe Biden. And that sort of gives the Democrats a an excuse or an opportunity to keep cash that's already been donated. Again, when you talk about political systems and messes, the Americans seem to be in uh, a right old state at this moment in time. Um, I'll take you first on this, Jim, because you've been concerned about Biden for some time mm -hmm. now. Yes, and um, I mean, the, the development since we last talked about it, you know, Biden sounds increasingly desperate, you know, saying only God can remove me and things like that. You well, feel it sort of. <laughs> <laughs> it, it feels like an, an end end game is is coming as far as Biden is concerned, and it does seem as if um, the idea of one of these governors, Gretchen Whitmer from Michigan or uh, Newsom from California, seems to be fading in favour of and for the reason you mentioned that the money's been donated to the joint ticket of Biden Harris. That that you know, if there is to be an alternative candidate, it will have to be Kamala Harris. Uh, she's not widely popular. She messed up on a major interview she did right at the beginning of her vice presidency. Um, and if it is to be her, um, there's going to have to be a massive exercise in the American people getting to know her because most people pay no attention to the vice president at all. Um, but apparently the strategy will be to focus heavily on the, the real danger of Donald Trump, you know, a man who will um, excuse himself of all the criminal charges against him likely take revenge on his opponents and has an ambiguous attitude to Putin, um, you know, and that will be the pitch that the uh, Kamala Harris will put. But, you know, as we speak, Joe is clinging on. Joe, the other thing that's been said over the weekend is, look, we're campaigning for Kamala Harris anyway, because she is the vice president in a presidency where it doesn't look as though Joe Biden could last 
four months, never mind four years. So yeah. would that be the worst move in the world for them? No, it wouldn't be the worst move, but they've left it a bit late in the day. I mean, you know, we all knew Al Gore, um, you know, who was vice president to the super charismatic Bill Clinton. But Al Gore was well known, well respected. He ploughed his own uh, furrow on climate change and technology and things like that. And I think Jim made the point when we spoke, spoke about this before, the real danger of Trump is that last time round he had relatively sensible people around him this time around he won't he will have you know it will be one flew over the cuckoo's nest and you know let's hope there's a nurse ratchet somewhere because <laughs> he's really really dangerous um and i think you know not just for america but for the rest of the world and i think you know you attack the danger of what a trump presidency could mean um has got to be their only way but Kamala Harris, you know, she's got to get out there. She's got to be seen. She's got to have somebody like Hillary Clinton or, or a Michelle Obama beside her to say, look, you know, this is the least worst option. What I think is interesting is that the guns now seem to be turning on Jill Biden, who has become this Lady Macbeth figure. And the general consensus is it's her who won't let him stand down. So, you know, always blame the women. It's always the woman's fault. Uh, Kevin, you're thinking on the situation in the States? Well, I'm, I'm just very disappointed, really, Frank, because I thought Jim, being a, a man of a certain generation, might stand up for a fair old timer. And, uh, you know, Jim is Jim is proof. There's still life in the old dog yet, isn't there? Surely. Thank you, Kevin. Thank um, you. <laughs> I don't know. Have you got? Have you got? Were you born in the states, Jim? Could you run for it yourself at this stage? I don't know. No. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, it's it's worrying. I, I sort of don't worry. You know, I touched on this on Saturday. I don't. Uh, I worry greatly about a Trump presidency, but it's sort of odd. In a, in the Bush era, you're worried about whether somebody's going to reach for the button a bit too quickly. Trump isn't like that. He doesn't. He doesn't like war. He doesn't like getting into war. Uh, I, I do worry that he's not going to put the defence up for Ukraine and in other situations, and it will, you know, he won't handle the situations with uh, Russia or China or North Korea or Iran very well. But uh, you don't worry about him going to war because that that's not his shtick, really, and he he knows that's not going to serve him well. Uh, and uh, you 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 worry about vice presidents a little bit, don't you? I mean, Kamala Harris, I've seen nothing bad there, but clearly she's not she's not got the support there for whatever reason that is, whether that's a real reason or whether it's about you know being a woman of colour and or being a woman. Uh, but she's not got support there. I don't feel confident that she's got enough armour and got enough support to um, to see out Trump, uh, particularly given the effective strategy he's got and the money he's got. Uh, and when it comes to vice presidents, you think about the kind of candidates that either went for it or got there, don't you? And uh, Al Gore's a great example, but the, the the name ringing in my ears is Dan Quayle. I mean, these people, <laughs> some some very odd people get very close to the... Uh, the Spy Remember and... Spyro Agnew? Oh, yeah. Spyro Agnew. <laughs> I mean, you know, we could bring them all out, couldn't we? But, um, yeah, and it's very, as I touched on on Saturday, I think it's very unfair on Jill Biden or on Barack or Michelle Obama to the people who, you know, do the Lady Macbeth Act. The party, in the very odd way that uh, American parties work, the, the party has to kind of make the case to Biden that, you know, in the end, you can't win. Uh, Trump is going to win and we've got to stop that at all costs. And that's the that's the bottom line. Well, we will see what this week brings. I think there's a crucial meeting tomorrow of Democrats, senior Democrats, to have a conversation with the president. And uh, let's see if that results in any conclusive action. I'm off to London now. I'm going to meet a couple of the newly elected MPs. And uh, I'm off to Tony Blair's conference tomorrow, the Tony Blair Institute conference tomorrow, where I'm sure there'll be lots of talk about the new government, what its policies perhaps could be in terms of tackling immigration, but also our relationship with Europe and the global economy. It's always a fabulous uh, set of discussions that uh, they put on for us. So I'm looking forward to that. Uh, Jim, are you back to Wimbledon or are you flying over to see Gareth Southgate continue to carry that Ming vase through to the semi-finals? Are you off to Germany by any chance, sir? No, I am not. No, I'm taking a wow, brief break. A uh, my, my next, my next engagement will be in uh, Kevin's territory when I'm seeing a day at Edgbaston against the West Indies later this month. Okay, and there's no finer place. Indeed. Yeah, let me get your predictions then. Are we going to be able to beat the Dutch on Wednesday evening? I, 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 I'm happier about playing the Netherlands than Turkey, actually. I, I thought Turkey were a really good team. And the Netherlands can be a bit flaky. You know you know what they say, if your name's on the thing, you're going to win it. But uh, 
and, and the French aren't apparently. I mean, I, if we play Spain, I'm I'm not sure. But I mean, I, I would fancy. I do fancy us against the Netherlands, and I would actually fancy us against France, being unduly okay. optimistic. Joe. Yeah, I'm I'm feeling quite optimistic actually. I mean, the Netherlands are not like they used to be back in the day, um, and I think you know the the result last weekend will give huge confidence and I think what you see amongst those young men is poise confidence and as Gary Lineker said you know they stepped up to the plate and delivered so let's hope mm. Kevin it's 1996 all over again isn't it we're <laughs> going to do it uh Southgate was there at the back in 1996 is there going to be at the front of a victory uh we're going to start playing and I'll end on this point uh uh Saturday's victory came at the hands of Trent Alexander-Arnold of Liverpool. I remember, I think, of uh, uh, Frank, you said that Jordan Pickford has always got a mistake in him. He had a penalty save in him. That's what he had in him. I've always got confidence in Everton players. (laughs) (laughs) Saved by Everton, won by Liverpool, as I said in one of my social media messages. And it says, I tell you this, I... Spent hours and hours on bloody social media during the election campaign and got very little traction, I have to say. I put that tweet out, honestly, that's all it said. Saved by Everton, um, won by Liverpool, and it was trending last time. <laughs> honestly, the things that people take notice of. Just goes There's a first time for everything, Frank. Oh, absolutely. Listen, it's been great to have your company again, guys. See you all again next week when we will be looking, I'm sure, back on another seven days of fascinating politics. Really looking forward to hearing the speech from our first female Chancellor, Rachel Reeves, later today. Thanks for joining us at the Downtown Den Politics Podcast. Don't do anything I wouldn't do for the next seven days and join us again next week. <laughs>